Welcome back to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This is where we blur the lines between business, nonprofit, and impact. I'm your host, Wendy V, and I'm a social impact strategist here to help you build a successful and sustainable legacy of social change. In this week's episode, we're going to hear from a social entrepreneur who has been on a journey to change the world just like you. If you are interested in social entrepreneurship, this is the place for you. Let's jump right into this week's episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. I'm super excited today because I get to talk to one of my friends from FinCon, the Financial Content Creators Conference that we go to every year to learn more about how we can up-level our game as finance creators. And I had the best time talking to David Delisle. He was just hanging out at the podcasting meetup and I said, who are you and what do you do? (laughs) And I came to find out that he helps a lot of people with their ability to share financial literacy with children and doing that through his own book and through a lot of different vehicles that he's been um, using in the last year. It's really inspiring to see how David is on this journey to help us help the next generation. And as we talk about a lot with sustainability and how we can make the world a better place, it all is about how do we make the better place for the future generations. So this is a direct episode about that concept, and I'm super excited to invite David to the show. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about um, what made you write a children's book and who are you and how did this how did this happen for you? <laughs> So many questions. I'm excited to be here, Wendy. Um, so I, I mean, we met at FinCon. I am a finance nerd. So I started getting into finance when I was like 11 and reading all those different, reading books by like Peter Lynch and about stock markets and value investing. So I've always been a finance nerd, um, but I've realized most people aren't. And so I've been investing for, I mean, over 30 years now, being a finance nerd. And I've got two young boys, and they're getting a little older, so it was sort of at a point where I was like, just want to pass down some lessons to them. And I realized that a lot of the lessons I want to pass down were around money and finance, because I look at it a little bit differently than most people. And then in doing that, it just evolved into this book. I was working, I was volunteering at their my children's library, watching all the kids reading graphic novels, and I saw how much excitement they had just reading these graphic novels, and I realized, like, here's something where I could take something I'm passionate about but most people aren't, put in a format that people will get and just deliver this message in a fun way. Because I think that's the thing is when we think of finance, most people, they start thinking like charts and money and macroeconomics. And I mean, I do as well because I love this stuff. But that's overwhelming for most people. And really, it's not that difficult. And so I tried to simplify it into what's the mindset, what's the habits. And to be honest, the rest doesn't really matter. So it is a children's book. But to be honest, it, it's meant for adults. It's just the adults don't get it. So I want to teach the kids so they can teach the adults. It's almost like a vehicle that the parents and the young person can come into this conversation with the assumption that the young person is the one learning, but really the parent is going to go on in the journey with them, essentially. For sure. And typically that's what happens. I mean, the parents come in just easy. They're just reading the book. And then I hear back from them, oh my God, I just learned... XYZ or I should be doing this or I didn't even think of things that way because it's just basic habits and and that's really what's important. I mean those those habits when it comes to finance and the mindset around it, I mean that's like 95% of it. And I think that's the thing as well is when I was um, trying to reflect on what I want to teach, it was a bit of a wake up call for me because I've overcomplicated things because I love it so much. and. If I just simplified and made things a little bit easier and stopped thinking about money as much and put it on autopilot, the savings, the investings, everything else, it would have been, I would have probably done just as well and I wouldn't have had all that stress. So I realized how much of it is noise and we get in our own way most of the time. Yeah, and if you're trying to then do something for your children, you're gonna pass down your habits. So it's like your children are definitely going to learn, you know, your style of managing money versus maybe the best way they could, or even something that's helpful on autopilot. So I can, I could see how that would, um, that would, that would translate really well into, you know, a book comes in an experience comes in that you do together and then the habits could co-change or 
at least a young person will know there's another way to do things. For sure. And that's the thing is it's just bringing that awareness. So trying to take away so much judgment. There's so much sort of feelings and judgment and there's a right way and there's a wrong way when it comes to money. And this is just, no, here's some ideas. Here's another way of thinking about it. Doesn't mean it's the right way, but it's another way. And, and really my goal in a perfect world would be someone would read the book, follow the habits that's in the mindset and get to a point where they don't think about money at all. I mean, that's, that's my goal. Like to me, that's financial mm-hmm. freedom is not thinking about money at all. Yeah, yeah, not having like the burden or the worry or, you know, and that's a complete shift of money mindset for a lot of people to not worry about money because, and I think I had heard this stat like recently where it was only 42% of people have some sort of worry or anxiety around money. And I'm like, that seems really low. (laughs) I feel like it's like 100% of people at some point have experienced that. Um, So to put things on autopilot, make it easier for yourself, that's a great tip. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what is the awesome stuff and why should parents be teaching this to to their young children or to their their young people? Um, Because I think that some parents might just not even think that this is something they need to actively teach. Yeah, so, so with the book, so basically in the book, a young boy goes on a journey and learns, you know, really only four key lessons, golden rules of money. And the first lesson is only buy the awesome stuff. And the reason that's the first lesson, and this is a really important lesson, and really why I'm doing this at all, is this is basically focusing on why you want money in the first place. Because everyone, when we start talking about it or learning about it or teaching it, we're always wondering how to have more, how to have more. And there's nothing wrong with having more, but if it's the only lesson we've ever learned, it doesn't matter how much we achieve, we're always still chasing more because that's all we know. And the awesome stuff gets you back into what really is important to you as the, the first lesson and just the, the, the basis and the framework for everything else. And what's really fun is even five-year-olds can get this because when you hear it, even as adults, I'm sure we're like, I know what my awesome stuff is, I know what I want to buy next, I know where I spend money. But it's a little bit more than that, and it's just getting in touch with really what lights you up. And like if I started talking to someone, you should feel it in your body. It should be one of those things that you get really excited about. And same with our kids. So they might say, oh, I love, you know, Pokemon cars, cards, or I love Lego, or I love trucks. And so they just want more, and all of those that they can get. And as parents, we get that. But even with those kids, there's the one thing that if your house was on fire or you're on vacation and you left something at the hotel room, you know there's that one thing that you, like the kids would just lose it if they lost. Like that is the thing that means the most to them. And as adults, we're the same. So it's, it's really getting in touch with what that is and then recognizing that it's different for everyone. So it's, it's a fun conversation to have as a family because then you can start talking about what your awesome stuff is for you and your family and everyone. Like, I mean, I'd be curious to know what, what your awesome stuff is for you, Wendy. Oh man, for a long time I thought it was my bike. I, I think like my, my bike is one of those things where I'm like, oh no, I really need to get it. But then I, I stopped riding it as much, so it kind of like devalued itself. So now I'm like, oh my God, my awesome stuff is probably my, my hard drive that goes with my business. Because if I, <laughs> if I don't have that in a fire, I'm really, really screwed. <laughs> But uh, but that's no fun. So I'm gonna go back to the bike. Um, but yeah, no, my hard drive is not my awesome stuff. Um, and I think that it's it's a it's an interesting concept because it, it invites you to really um, focus in on the embodiment of your your things, right? Because sometimes we just have things around us and even if you're like on the the hoarding spectrum you have like a lot of things around you but um people might buy stuff and it doesn't necessarily have any sentimental value or any meaning but what you're kind of saying is well there's meaning in some of the the things that we have and if you connect with it you'll you'll notice (laughs) and that is a really great tip are there other tips in the book that um for parents that you want to just share with the audience yeah um real quickly on the awesome stuff though like it's Some of it, it's not just about um, getting in touch with the things that you really love as well. It's just noticing how much those things do bring you happiness. And in recognizing that, realizing the things that don't bring you happiness. Because what we don't realize is the more stuff we have, like it all has a cost. Like the obvious cost is financial. And so it's something that you could spend money on instead. 
but it also takes up time to buy that item, time to maintain it, it takes up headspace. Like you said, like if you're a hoarder, there's there's you've got to store this, and then there's it's around you, so you see it. So there's a distraction. Like the, everything has a bit of a cost to it. So once you start recognizing what really makes you happy, you also recognize what doesn't make you happy, and so it just sort of streamlines your life towards what really lights you up. So that's that's what gets fun with it. And it, and it can be experiences as well. It doesn't have to be things, but, mm-hmm. but I just want to, you know, make that point. Um, yeah, no, then, that's great. Um, but then getting back to parents, I mean, the one of the easiest things we can start doing with our kids is just talking about money because we tend to not talk about it. It's one of these taboo subjects. We're always worried about it or we don't know what to say or maybe we don't want to teach them wrong, the wrong things. But at the same time, like a common value most parents would say that they want to teach their kids is the value of money. Like that's just a, that's what they're worried about. Like how to save and the value of money. But the thing is, is we don't tell them how much things cost. We don't talk about money. So there's absolutely no way they can learn the value of money if they don't know how much that burger costs or how much you put, how much the gas costs or your vehicle or your house or all these things. So just having a conversation of letting them know how much things actually cost and talking about money in that way and, and not in a judgy way or a guilty way, just, hey, when we go do this thing, we went to the fair, this is how much it costs to go to the fair, this is how much it costs to go to the movies and just letting them be aware of what those things cost and then in their own minds, they can start equating, okay, a movie costs this and a bike costs this the movie feels like a rip-off to me because I'd rather have the bike or whatever it is. Like They don't even have to have the conversation. Just knowing the value of things starts to teach them the value of money. It reminds me of one of my friends. She told me the other day her daughter said, oh, well, we can buy that. You have a lot of money, Mom. <laughs> and it was really funny because her, her mom was like, if she only knew you know, how, how much it costs to live. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. It's... It can be a perception of, you know, I don't know what it costs to buy something, but it also could be a perception that you have infinite money, parent, (laughs) because it just comes to you magically. I don't know how, I don't know how much. (laughs) And I'm sure we also don't tell kids how much money we make in order to pay for those things too, because that's also been, you know, kind of taboo. So that's that's an interesting concept of letting kids into the door of even how much does it cost. Yeah, and it just starts that conversation, and they can start valuing things. So when we take them to a fancy dinner, for example, or spend a lot on, you know, a vacation or a flight or any of these things, they can start equating it. They start understanding, like, oh, like my Lego is only twenty dollars, but this meal just cost you know two hundred dollars. And for like a little kid, like that's like mind blowing, and they'll be like, yeah, I yeah, spent yeah. so much money on that food. <laughs> it and was just, only one plate. <laughs> Exactly. And just having those conversations. And then that brings you back to that conversation around the awesome stuff as well, because it's really about values and what brings you happiness. So then you can start seeing, well, what what is important, like as a family, as individuals, why are we spending this on different things? And just those conversations, it just, it suddenly opens up the door to a lot more and, and really starts having these conversations, because otherwise, we just don't know. And I think if that's what, if that's if we don't know, then what we're looking at is like social media, commercials, TV, or stars, and then we start being taught money by you know all this perception with no fact behind it, and get caught up in in dreaming about something that we don't even know why we want it. It's just the only thing we've ever been taught. So this is just another way to to teach another another side of things. And I think with the happiness part, you're talking about experiences. I know some of the times that I'm you know, I, I wouldn't be able to take them with me if there was a fire, but some of my most treasured experiences are traveling and seeing the world and experiencing, you know, different cuisines, different cultures, like all of those types of things. So yeah, those would be very valuable things that would always go with me as memories, um, but I can't necessarily take them <laughs> if we had an emergency. So I, yeah, I think those would also be part of my awesome stuff list. Um, and I know that, you know, you've been talking about this book, this book has been a big part of your life. And I really want to explore, have you been able to see, you know, what impact you've made by writing this book or going through this process to teach people these skills? What it, what have people told you about the impact that you've had on their lives? Uh, yeah, it's really fun because it's, it is that awareness. So 
with the young kids, they pick up all sorts of different things. So I know there's kids where they'll read the book, and as soon as they read it, all of a sudden they're like, okay, for my birthday, this just happened at FinCon. It was so cute. Uh, a little boy read the book, and then the next day told their parents, and they mentioned to me, and did a post uh their son wanted money for this, their birthday so they could get invested and start up, you know, a savings account, and and it was just so so cute because it wasn't. There's the the book is very very easy in the sense of it doesn't say do this or do that. It just provides information on, you know, compound growth and the idea of saving and what money can become and your awesome stuff, and so that the, this young child just extrapolated from that. And I get a lot of parents as well like the awesome stuff really lands with certain people because they start recognizing where they've been spending their money and how that's not really what's important to them. So you hear from people like travel or freedom, like financial freedom, they don't want to work at their job or more time with family. But then you look at the spending habits and they aren't in line with what really is their awesome stuff. So it shifts things even recognizing what well, what is important. Is it you know, the clothes, or is it that second vacation home, or is it retiring five years early? Like, just, just that awareness. I noticed that that really lands with a lot of people, and so that's really fun. And just kids getting it. I mean, if, if kids start, the thing is, is kids have time on their side, and that's what we know is, you know, as money nerds, we get that time is so much more valuable when it comes to investing and accumulating wealth than anything else. So we might try to, you know, overthink it and figure out you know what investment's going to have the best return and how much should we be saving all these other things but as a young child if they start reading this and learning these concepts at like 10 or 15 or even 20 then they they they're set up for early retirement money not being a big thing like you start these habits in your your teens and 20s and it doesn't take much 20 30 years and you can achieve financial freedom so it's uh, it's pretty fun hearing those stories. Yeah, and and it's a transformation probably for some families who wouldn't even think about financial freedom as being an option or something that they would, you know, be able to pass on to the next generation. So I'm sure that 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 makes a big impact too for whoever is going to be in that family in the future. If you have someone <laughs> who has been able to achieve financial freedom and does have good investments and they pass it on in the right way to, you know, somebody in their family, that really does build the the legacy part. So that's awesome. Um, and I think the um, the part that you mentioned about that what makes you happy is really important too because people connecting to that idea of happiness being achievable it gives hope that you know, your life can be transformed and so it, do you want to talk a little bit more about that like what is that um, looked like you know being able to show people that you you can be happy but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend more money. Yeah, it's just that focus on what's what's important, and that's that's what's so great about this this concept because it's not about being frugal or cheap or budgeting or doing without. It's recognizing what does make you happy, so you don't feel like you have less because you you start recognizing that. So a, a, a simplest example that I would use is like as a parent seeing a young child, you know, begging for ice cream. And as parents, we're always stuck. Like, do we say yes? Do we say no? If we say no, do we say because it it's too much money or you just had this or we don't want to spend? Like, we don't know what to do. But if we're thinking about what really makes you happy, and we've already had that conversation with our kids, even the five-year-old, we can put back on them, is that your awesome stuff? And that same child will stop, they'll reflect, and they'll think about it. And at that point, it doesn't matter if they say yes or no. It doesn't really matter what the answer is. The fact that they reflect on, is this something that really will make me happy? Or did I just walk by and see everyone having ice cream and I thought I wanted to? And it just shifts everything because then they start you know, asking themselves and as adults as well, like, what does make you happy? Where are you lit up? What does get you excited? Like you mentioned the hard drive, which isn't very sexy. But if I dug a bit deeper, I'm sure it's because it's linked to the show, the impact you're having, the people you're talking to. And I bet it suddenly all of a sudden you'd light up, you get excited, it'd be a whole different conversation because you've recognized like that is important to you. It's not the hard drive, it's what this what this impact is or what this thing is to you. And that's the thing is once you start recognizing that, it's really hard to feel like you don't have enough or if only, or you start throwing in the shoulds because you you all, you you can feel in your body when you're 
when you're happy when you're not and when you're doing what you're excited about and when you're you're not and and once you start recognizing that it shifts everything from looking for more to buy to doing more of what you love and it's funny that you mentioned the hard drive again because i was i was giggling to myself that what's on the hard drive is also besides all of my stuff that i do adore related to the show and my clients is um all of the pictures of my travels and so when i was talking about the travels that's a direct connection between where the travels live in the memories and the hard drive and i was i was laughing i was like "Ooh, david did dig right into the source of this <laughs> of this thing it's really awesome i love it and we keep saying awesome in this episode it's just hilarious because it's it's so true right like there are certain things that are triggers for you of like oh no that that really does represent happiness in my life and so the the tangential things around it also kind of represent that too. And I, I love that idea. Um, and I wanted to ask you, because you, you mentioned this, you know, connecting with family and spending time and, you know, having that time to be able to do that. How do you balance, you know, what you're doing as a social entrepreneur, trying to get the book out and anything else you've got going on in your professional life? How do you balance that with being a parent and your family and your own well-being as, as an adult and a person? Um, what does that look like for you with your routines and just what you've had to do in your self-development journey? Um, it's gotten a little trickier. So you should have been very good at creating a lot of space <clears throat> to do those things that I love. So for myself, like I've been semi-retired since 40, so I've had a lot more space. But then this book and this passion and teaching has sort of taken over something that I do love so much. So I find it could easily consume all of my time and more than all of my time because there's so many ways to sort of get this message out, build a platform around it, do the speaking, do the marketing, like there's there's no end. So, so it can feel a little overwhelming. But for me, like my awesome stuff, I love doing stuff with the kids. I love being able to volunteer at the children's school. So even the other day, like I was there, they had like their uh, a sushi day. So I was able to like volunteer as a parent and gather all that together. Or I'll volunteer in the library. or outdoor field trips. So I try to make those the number one priority and then build things around that. And so lately it has gotten a little trickier, but I do try to figure out like what are those, what are those things that are really important and focus on like those those number one. Um, I think I do tend to try to lean back on when I'm really feeling overwhelmed is this idea, I believe it's uh, Pareto's law, it's that 80-20 rule where like 20% of your happiness comes from 80% of the things you're doing or 80%, like it's just a ratio. But a lot of times it's it's most of, most of what you're doing comes from very little. So actually I had it reversed. So it'd be like 80% of your happiness comes from 20% of the things you're doing or, and you could do it like 90%, 10%. And so sort of trying to recognize in all those areas, like as far as impact, what are the, you know, 10% of the things I do that'll have the 90% impact or what are the 10% of the things that I do that have a 90% return on my happiness or same with friends. So I try to try to play with that a bit and try to really focus on the things that really do make a difference, but it can get a little overwhelming. Um, I also, I do uh, a meditation as well. Ideally it would be a daily meditation practice. It doesn't always happen as the case, but I find, and I don't know if this is a thing with money nerds. I mean, you can answer this for me as well, Wendy, Wendy but I find for myself anyway, I'm very in my head. And so I'm always, you know, I'm cerebral, I'm thinking in my head. And that's not really where the, you know, happiness is or just enjoying life is. You really want to be in the present. So that's where the meditation practice really does help me sink into the present. Being around the kids and volunteering with them really allows me to sink into the present. So as much as I can just be present and not in my head thinking about the future, uh, that that always helps with with the balance in general. Yeah, I, I I don't know if it's just money nerds. I think there's a lot of people, and I know a lot of people even in our community of the Social Impact Level Up Collective have told me because I, I try to offer meditation to the community, and I'm like, guys, this is a really good deal. Like, here, come come get a free meditation. Come like hang out and just chill. And people are just like, I cannot meditate. I cannot turn my head off and. Then we have to go into a conversation of like, well, what is that about? You know, then we get into the whole coaching thing of like, let's talk about what's going on with you that you need to you need to turn your head off eventually. But um, how do you do that? And I think that you, you brought it up as well. You know, when you start 
going and following your passion, things get exciting, but they also can get overwhelming really quickly. If you're, you know, you're really working in that space of that nexus of like, I'm, I'm working on my passion. I'm excited about it. And I know there's so much to be done and I'm motivated. It's easy to lose sight of, you know, the other things that ground you like meditation or, or time to yourself or nature or any of those things. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that part of it before, but the excitement is really what fuels the forgetting about the other routines that help you. <laughs> exactly. And you do need those routines. And I will say with the meditation, because I, I was one of those people where it just, it was extremely difficult. Like even when I first started meditating, it was like, um, so I do uh, transcendental meditation, which basically you just repeat a, a mantra that they give you over and over. And so when I first started doing it, it was almost like just because my mind would wander. So I just like focus as hard as I could, just mantra, 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 like just trying to like not think of anything else and that's not what meditation is so you're, you're gonna get a headache you're gonna hurt yourself that meditation your mind is supposed to wander it's that but as it wanders you bring it back to the present again and it's that bringing it back to the present that's the entire exercise so it doesn't matter if your mind wanders the entire time it's just that act of getting into the habit of bringing it back into the present and over time it gets easier and easier so you'll find yourself just in daily life, not always being so distracted and thinking of the next thing. And and I mean, I, so here's a good example. Here's a fun story. I just uh, recently went with my boys to Disneyland. And I don't know if anyone's going to Disneyland post-COVID, but it not, is... No, I have not since 2018. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like, we're, we live on the West Coast uh, in Canada, but we're close to Anaheim in LA. So we go to Disneyland a lot, or we did post uh, pre-COVID. And we, I've been going for years, and just the crowds, the lineups, the chaos, everything's more expensive now. Everything you have to book over again. Like, you have to book the park just to get into the park. You can't just show up anymore. Like, everything's just chaos. And so I went there with my boys, and I just, the first day, like, I was just, it was overwhelming. I was like, I'm not coming back. This is too much, and just, I like to still have fun, but it was one of those trips where, you know, I'm here in Disneyland, happiest place on, you know, on earth, and I'm and I'm forcing it. Like I'm I'm making it fun, but it's it's an effort. But then when I finally got to the point where it's like just I let go a little bit more, I cared less. It didn't matter if there's lineups and there's crowds, and we're not gonna do everything, just just be in the moment, just my boys are young, every trip with them changes. So like these moments, I'll never have these moments again with them at this age in Disneyland enjoying the rise they are and just that excitement and the crowds yes there's that but the parades and the parades and the music and the food and just letting go of everything and just being more present it shifted it shifted all of a sudden like that anxiety dropped away the stress dropped away just the, the anger of even being on the trip dropped away like it just started becoming a really fun trip the more i let go and the more present i was and I think that's a good example because there too, like you're thinking about like the next ride and how to get in the rides and where I'm going to go next, what I'm going to do for food. Like it's just, it's overwhelmed. But as soon as you drop all of that, it's, it was a much better trip. And heaven forbid somebody need to go to the bathroom in the middle of all of that because then that like derails the whole plan that you had. Oh no, bathroom. <laughs> oh, we, we had this middle of the lines and like you're dragging, like exiting a line and you just have yes. to, yeah. Yes, it's, the whole thing. It's chaos. <laughs> So I grew up going to Disneyland, so I know exactly what you mean, and I can't imagine it now. <laughs> it's crazier because everything now that it's you, you've got these tighter windows. You got to book a certain way. Even when you hop parks, you can't hop parks till after one o'clock. Even if you have that park hopper pass, like it's just it's chaos. But again, like ignoring all the chaos of it. You can look at it as chaos and chasing and trying to like, how do I jam everything in? How do I do everything? What are we doing for dinner? How do I book the next thing? And just racing or slow down, be present, enjoy the moment and just appreciate it for what it is because there is some real magic there in those moments. And I think that that was a good, good reminder for me anyway. Yeah, because you never want to be in the happiest place on earth and you're like, I'm unhappy. <laughs> and I have been that person before. I, I, I am notoriously not the person to take Disneyland, just FYI, um, because I get anxious around all of that. And me not having kids, I don't even know what to do with strollers coming at me. So with, with stroller, like, when multiple strollers come different directions at me, I just stop like a light post and I'm like, ah! 
you know, it's it's hilarious. And it, it, I know that last time I went to Disneyland, I thought the same thing. I was like, gosh, there's so much pressure to just exist here. Like to go through the day in your brain, you're like, I want to see this. I want to see that. I want to go to this parade. I want to do this. I want to go to the pulling the sword out of the stone, like all the things I'm trying to get to. And they happen at this time. And I got to walk super fast to get there. And it's just, it's stressful. And so I could appreciate the, um, the approach of just like letting go of all that. And just like, what is, is, is what is today. And I know I'm going to spend a bunch of money. I know I'm going to wait in line and stand for a long time. And that's okay. And I can I can be happy in that, even with all those things going on. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a really good example. And I think really it's it's a metaphor for life. Like that's what I found. Like when I was there. Like I, I teach all these things, I talk about these things, and still I get it's all so anxious, true. <laughs> and I run around like oh why? Like just slow it down and and we we had a great time. We didn't maybe go on the rides that we really want to go on, but we went on ones that were enjoyable and had food that we wanted and had a nicer pace and just did some really cool things. And and just noticing, I think that's another good example of how quickly things pass us by because we're thinking of the next thing. And Disney has the same thing. We're thinking of the next ride, we're thinking of what we need to do, like the Sword of the Stone thing or the next parade or the next event. Instead of just recognizing like what's right in front of us and and that's, that's getting back to the awesome stuff. So when I think about this whole thing, I, I describe it as a journey because it's not like a destination where like you get there and you finally achieve everything you want. It's no, like the whole just life itself, recognizing what there is, what you're enjoying, what you're doing, where you're putting your effort and slowing down some of that pace. And, and that's where I, why I, I find the whole finance stuff is so important, the money stuff, is because for a lot of us, we're just on this this pace of just maintaining a lifestyle. So we have to achieve a certain amount of money to maintain that lifestyle. We're constantly chasing. And if we just dial back just a little bit and create a little bit more space financially and in terms of time, all of a sudden like we'd have that breathing room and really recognize like what we do have. I mean, wherever anyone lives, I'm sure you walk out your front door, people come there on vacation and tour that you know your town your things and explore and we take it for granted it's right there in our backyard so oh yeah i live in washington dc so i am the tour guide when people come here i so i don't go to the touristy things because i know i'm going to go when somebody comes to visit and it takes me a while in between things like if something opens in between major visits of family and friends for me to like go see the museum of the african american natural or the sorry any of the, the smithsonian's anything that's opened in the last couple of years I've gone only when people come and it's, I live here so I could go on any weekend. Like I could go see the Martin Luther King, like junior, um, memorial, like any time, but I just don't. Right. And so I waited until my family came and then I went and saw all of it at the same time. And it was like this rush from here and rush from there. And so it reminds me of your, your Disney example, because it's all around the same area in DC, you know? And so you gotta like walk across the mall in different directions to get to the different things. And I remember just being like, ah, this is kind of exhausting, right? And why didn't I just come here on a like average Saturday? <laughs> and I, I don't I don't need my family to be there. I don't need friends to be there. I could just enjoy it. Um, and so I appreciate what you're saying. And I think the happiness part is from collecting those memories and collecting those experiences. And yes, it is sometimes, you know, we're worried about money or worried about all these other things as we're going through it. But um, there's tons of ways to live you know very like you said it, it could be frugal it could be one way to say it but also to just enjoy yourself and live and you don't have to have that pressure of money fueling it um and i think even with areas like this in dc you know you live in vancouver right i mean that's actually a pretty big city in those areas it's it costs a lot to live <laughs> any of the major cities it costs a lot to live in it everywhere now and you were mentioning the inflation in disney i think that that's um that also kind of has helped people understand that I do need to invest differently in the things that make me happy because now everything is more expensive. And I don't know if you've noticed that as well um, in talking to people, but it is it is kind of difficult now. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where we're not there yet, but the other shoe's about to drop. Like it's it's almost like there's there's been this huge allowance over COVID where people could just, you know, 
there's all like governments and people and everyone it's almost like okay well we're in the middle of this pandemic money's going to be tight so just borrow and it's fine and the government's going to give you money so it's fine and nobody has really had to think about or worry about their finances but as we come out the other side of this there's going to be massive amounts of debt on an individual level plus a government level and it gets going to hit all at once at the same time inflation's catching up a uh, younger generation is not used to high interest rates but what we've had the last like the decade and longer has been extremely low interest rates which is going to yeah. have a massive impact like all these things are happening so you know our, our the next generation of kids like they're the ones who are going to suffer unless we start teaching some of these habits now because it's the world's just exploding in a way where it is going to get extremely expensive to live and and we just don't it's not going to go back down it's like it's not going back down no and i and i notice this every time i go to the grocery store and i cringe and i'm like can we just go back to like when this cost two dollars less like i was <laughs> i was already cringing at that level but it was tolerable now when i go in and i'm like my yogurt is two dollars more and like that's not okay with me that means like do i really need yogurt like you know and then there's these other questions that you have in your head and i think you're right it's it's going to eventually be everybody will feel this including you know the younger generations but they will have to burden it for more of their life than those of us who are now adults and are like Ooh, oops you know <laughs> that's unfortunate yeah. um but i mean none of, nobody expected to have a pandemic and i think that how, how we navigate our way out of it and still manage to take the lessons learned and apply them and try to make change or try to help other generations, you know, think about, well, what if this happened again? You know, did we even document all of the lessons learned yet? I'm not entirely sure we have. <laughs> so I, going, like you're saying, teaching kids how to like kind of make the future a little bit easier to navigate with skills, you know, that might be one answer to that. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, our, the next generation is going to have to get a lot smarter about money. And and that's where all these con conversations, they just dovetail into each other. So the habits of saving, that's going to set them up so they have a little bit of a buffer. The conversation around the awesome stuff is going to allow them to focus on what's really important. And then a lot of us as well is going to be just adjusting that lifestyle inflation that we all have. And if you recognize, if you just dial that back just a little bit, then you have that space to do these things that you love, not feel tight, weather a pandemic, have your money, you know, creating wealth and growing for you. And it feels hard to do that, but for everybody, it doesn't matter what income you're making or what you're earning or what your lifestyle is, we're almost to a person living to the maximum of our lifestyle. Like that's just what we do. If you have more money, you move into a bigger house or you buy a bigger car or move into a more expensive city. It just, it's automatic. So if we just recognize to dial that back just slightly and that's the space that we create. And then as we create more, we still, you know, we can still buy more and do more, but still maintain that space. Yep. And that's what I want to try to teach the kids is maintain that space. Then you're never living paycheck to paycheck and really stuck because uh, for, for almost everybody, if you're making 100000 a year or a million a year, a lot of us are still living paycheck to paycheck because we just increase our lifestyle to fit into that new budget. And, and that's scary. And it's the, the poor next generation. I mean, they're going to be the ones servicing this debt that we've created. And yes. it's going to affect them. And they're going to have to go into their own debt, too, just to be able to get to where we got to, which is, you know, the, the student loan stuff is still going to be part of the problem. So all of that. Well, my light has now gone off, which now means apparently it's time to go. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't realize it was on a timer. Sorry, y'all. Lighting changed. Um, but I wanted to just check in with you before we before we end. Where can people connect with you if they are interested in the awesome stuff? Like, where do they acquire this wonderful book that we've been talking about? And how can um, you know people just be able to be part of your world and, and hear more from you? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so the book's The Golden Quest, and you can find it on Amazon. You can also request it in bookstores. And my website, everything is based around this concept of the awesome stuff. So the website's theawesomestuff.com. Uh, you can find me on TikTok or Instagram at theawesomestuff. And so anything around the awesome stuff, 
that's going to be me. Otherwise, if you want to request the book, you can buy it on the website, but also, like I said, bookstores, Amazon, and it's called The Golden Quest, and it's a graphic novel. It's targeted towards kids probably around 5 to 12, but as I mentioned, the, the lessons in there are for adults, so I'd love to see it for, you know, high school grads and early 20s going on their first job. Like, it really is a great book for anyone who just wants to learn basic habits and mindset around money. That's, yeah, and I think that people, you know, being able to give this as a gift even would be wonderful. So if people are interested and you want to give it as a birthday gift or something, it would be a cool thing. I love to give books as birthday gifts for little kids. Being the, like, cool auntie that I am, I give books, right? (laughs) And and kids actually enjoy them. Like, I'm that nerdy auntie who's like, here's a book, kid, and they're like, oh, cool. And so, you know, that's, that's one of my things that I like to do. So if you are interested in David's book and you want to order it online you heard it first it's on amazon it's on his website which is also the awesome stuff everywhere you can find him and um and you do speaking too right you're speaking about the book now yeah exactly so i'm tr- and doing trying to do more and more speaking get this message out and and really just encourage conversations around money so the number one thing is just having the conversations as, itself as a family so so speaking about it and i'm actually Um, It hasn't been announced yet, but we're working on a conference for families uh, for around this time next year where families can come and learn about money in this sort of fun environment where we're going to basically gamify the whole environment, give families money, and they can play this game and learn about money um, at this conference. So. Oh, that's cool. So in person. Oh, no, this this is the post pandemic era. We're like, oh, my God, something in person like it seems so rare. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... in person, they can interact. And the beauty of it, what I'm really hoping is you'd come with the multi generation as well. So parents will come with their kids, but also their parents. So you'll have the three generations of kids like people there as a family and then you can interact so you can make choices and your decisions are going to impact how much money you make or earn in this game and make those decisions as a family and then at the end every family will have so much money that they've accumulated during the game and see how they rank up and how it went for them and lessons they learned so it's going to be a really cool concept i love it i can't wait to see when that comes out so well, thank you so much for being here and for being part of the podcast. We super appreciate it. And this has been the Social Impact Level Up podcast. We've been here with David Delisle. We we're talking about the awesome stuff and his book, The Golden Quest, and how you can connect with him is on any social media platform looking for the awesome stuff. And this is Wendy V. We are here with the Social Impact Level Up collective. I'm always um, looking for people to come and join our community as well. And you can find us on any social media platform. All right. Thanks, David, for being here. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. It's been awesome to interview today's guest, and I hope that you leave inspired to take action. If you're looking for any of the information we spoke about, it's probably down in the show notes. Make sure that you're checking them out and you're clicking on any of the links that seem exciting to you. If you are looking for a coach or a consultant to help you with your social impact or your sustainability, reach out to me via my website, hop on my email list, or jump into one of my programs. All of the links are below. So excited to have you as part of the collective. Make sure that you come back and join us for another episode next week.